So, uh, lockdown cooking. So I know that uh, a lot of people have started baking bread and getting involved in um, baking, bread making, home craft making over the course of lockdown. So as someone who makes, a, I make a lot of my own bread at home, but I want to give it a more historical twist. So today I'm going to be baking Tudor bread. So I'm going to be making, baking, <laughs> um, Tudor style manship bread. So bread was a staple of diet within the 16th century. It's where most people got the majority of their calorific output for the day. It was you know, the food of the nation, it was what gave you your energy, kept you going. It's a huge part of the Tudor diet. And how they approached bread was very different than how modern bread is. Because for us, getting making a loaf of bread is really easy. You go get a bread mix at the shop, you go get yeast at the shop. But none of that was available, obviously, 500 years ago. For a start, commercially made yeast is a very new new product before the only way you could get yeast was by um, collecting wild yeast so yeast is a naturally occurring fungus in the world it grows on soft fruits and berries and if you put a, a sugar flour mixture out you can attract uh, yeast spores and grow your own cultured yeast that way you need to be in an area where there's and um, not much air pollution where it's, the air is quite pure to get that so you can collect it that way although you know difficult tricky <laughs> involves you hiking out to some sort of ridge and leaving a bowl in place for a while so you could do that uh, the other way you could get yeast was to create and ferment yeast based on brewing so if you're a housewife and you brew your own beer at home you can take the scum off fermenting beer process that up, leave it to ferment, and you've got your own yeast culture that way. Both of them require significant effort. So the majority of Tudor bread was a sourdough starter, which everyone's been doing over lockdown, where you take some bread, you leave it to one side, you let it ferment, and you've got sort of a yeast culture. Or, especially in areas where there wasn't access to wheat because of local climate concerns, local different soil types, different environments, especially in the north of England, people would create a lot of flatbread. So lots of rye and oat flatbreads that can be griddled really quickly on a sort of little stone. But for those who had access to more refined flour, uh, access to yeast, access to the money and effort to do it, the best kind of bread you can make was a manship bread, which is sort of similar I'd say to a wholemeal loaf that we have today a more white wholemeal you've got to get the the outer husk of the grain removed in order to make a really high quality white flour which is tricky it takes a lot of effort so manship bread is only really for the very finest of people so we're gonna have a go at making it today so uh, starting off you've got to find the right kind of flour. So modern flour that we have in the UK is very different to how flour would have been 500 years ago. We have a very refined wheat germ plant. So if you look out and buy commercially grown wheat, it's homogenized, it's grown for maximum potential. It's at least twice the size as it was 500 years ago, where you're looking at a Tudor farmer would buy a bag of wheat grain that was 20, 50 different varieties all mixed in together and he would sow it all as one because you don't know what's going to grow and what's not going to grow dependent on how the year is. So their wheat flour was not homogenous. It was all jumbled together, very different types of flour. So the nearest one that we can get to what was there is to go for a more organic white flour. So I've gone to Shipton Mill, who do organic homegrown flowers, and I've gone for their white stone ground flour. So unlike modern milled flour, this uses the traditional sort of hurdy-gurdy, hurdy-gurdy? More traditional sort of bloody it's millstone. It's a fucking millstone. I know what it's called. So it's more sort of authentic and it should provide a very different texture and gluten strands than you would have from a more modern flour. 
as said, um, Tudor bakers, Tudor housewives baking bread, their yeast cultures were very different. So for this manship bread recipe, instead of using a commercially quick rise yeast that you can get at any supermarket, I've gone, I've tried to create my own fermented beer yeast culture. So what I've done, oh, it's gone very gross. So, I, so I've taken a cup of beer and I've mixed in some quick dry yeast in there to create the yeasty, beery, unique flavour that is manship bread. So I've mixed that up. I'm going to leave that to one side to ferment and grow because the yeast is it's alive. You need to nurture it and grow it. Once that's ready, I'm looking for a real froth in it. So when it starts getting frothy, I know the yeast is active and alive and ready to cause lots of lovely air bubbles in my bread. And once that's ready, I'll start mixing out some flour. Okay, so while my yeast is fermenting, what I've done is, look at my lovely, my lovely old fashioned bar, my Christmas present, because <laughs> that's the kind of thing that I like. And I've got, if you can see in there, I've got three cupfuls of my stone ground flour. And what I'm going to do now is I'll make a well to put my liquid in so I can mix it up gradually. But first things first, I have to add in some salt. So it's best to do it at this stage of the process because salt kills yeast dead. And obviously we need the yeast in order for the bread to rise. No salt, no wonderful, lovely bread strands so it's best to put the salt in at this stage and to work it fully and ingratiate it into the flour so when the yeast does come across salt it doesn't die and if you're asking why I do I need salt in my bread flour uh, if there's no salt then the bread has no flavour and it'll kind of all been not worth it because I want a nice tasting bread at the end of all this. Okay, so <laughs> as you can see from my very, very untidy bowl, um, I've got a well in the centre here. And I'm going to start adding my yeast in, my yeast mixture, very slowly. Because what I don't want to do is flood it with too much liquid at once and to overwhelm the flour. So I'm going to add it gradually, mix into a, into a dough-like consistency over time. So I'll control the amount of liquid going in because I don't... So if you put in too much all at once, it just sort of means that the flour is not absorbing it and you end up with just a very sloppy runny dough. So I'm going to start off with a spoon. I'll graduate to using my hands, but at the moment it's just about controlling the amount of flour to liquid to get the best, as you can see. So once that's... Done. I'll add in some more. It really, really stinks of beer, which I don't like. Uh, I don't drink. Uh, long term, <laughs> long term viewers uh, may be aware that I have a neurological condition. Um, I basically the brain comes out the back of my skull. It's fun. Uh, what it means is I can't metabolize alcohol very well, so I'm quite sensitive to it, and I hate the smell. As you can see it's already starting. It's building up really quickly. I might have to actually just make some extra beer and yeast mixture. So give me a moment and I'll come back when this looks more like an actual dough. So I appreciate it doesn't look the best right now. Uh, it got a little bit over wet, which I don't normally mind in a dough because then I can add more flour while I'm kneading it. Sort of just if it's too dry coming into this stage, then it makes kneading it more impossible, but then I can add more flour right now and sort of maintain some integrity. So next, it, I'm going to be kneading it for seven minutes. So set, <laughs> seven minutes. So it's a push and a pull action. And then what I'm going to be doing is building up gluten strains inside it to kind of give it that air, to give it a nice rise. So... Um, what I like to do when I'm kneading, which I can't do right now because of copyright strikes, is I like to have a song with a good strong beat so I can just keep up the action because it's quite, <laughs> it takes a lot of effort to knead bread. Uh, it gets quite hot and sweaty. So, um, I don't know, uh, I think I've got Love Shack where the B-52 is on right now, so that might be a good one. Um, I like to use a lot of Depeche Mode when I'm kneading as well because the electronic things can do that. Or I might listen to a bit of Dream Nails. Uh, you can see I'm wearing their shirt, their latest song, Gillian, which is an ode to 
uh, fitness trainers. Uh, that's got a really great sort of workout beat. So that will also be very good. So once this has been kneaded for seven minutes, uh, we'll have a look and see uh, what it looks like at that point. As you can see, it's become a lot more solid. Uh, I did actually end up adding too much liquid, which is okay. Um, it's getting a bit sticky now, but uh, it's a nice shape. It's nice and elastic. So, oh God, stop sticking to the bloody counter. Oh. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in a bowl, a greased bowl, because <laughs> I've made that mistake many a time where I've not greased a proving bowl and it's just sort of stuck. So I'm going to oil up a bowl. Come on, behave, though. Behave, you're a camera star now. Uh, oil up a bowl, leave it in a nice warm spot. Uh, I've got some lovely French windows that are great for proving bread. Uh, leave it for about an hour. God, you can see how disgusting my hands are after kneading it. Leave it for an hour and we're going to see how big it gets and hopefully I'm aiming for it to at least double in size. That will be a good sign that the yeast has worked and that there's lots of lovely air inside this dough. Uh, it's been an hour and a half and I was kind of a bit wary. I thought that the, the yeast beer mixture hadn't quite worked so I left it a little bit longer than I would have. Uh, I let my oven preheat. It's on 100, 170 degrees. So it's a little bit lower than I would have for bread, but it's what the recipe's going for, so we'll see. Ooh, so oh my come with the cloth. Oh that's very hot and warm. Look at that. Look how big that's got. So it is very, very warm. The heat coming off that is quite intense, but look at the size of that. You can hear it bubbling away. It does Oh gosh, it smells of vodka. <laughs> um, but look how cool that is. So what I'm next going to do is I'm going to decant it onto a baking tray. Oil that up so <laughs> the bread doesn't stick to it. Um, what will happen during this process is that probably some of the air will come out. That's called a knockback. It wasn't in the recipe. Some breads call for it, some breads don't. But what I'm aiming for is for the air to stay in the bread because that... The expanding air bubbles is what causes bread to rise. So uh, I'll put it on a baking tray, I'll make it all all nice, and let's see what it looks like. Um, it did form a bit of a skin, which I didn't particularly want, and some of the air did knock out, so it is looking a bit <laughs> flatter than I wanted. I'm just going to add some steam holes, because one of the problems with bread is that as the air the air holes inside um, form, what can happen is that steam can get trapped inside, which makes the bread soggy and tough, and you don't want that. That would make it um, unpleasant, so you need to put some gaps for the steam to come out. Um, if you remember the old nursery rhyme, um, Patake Patake, where it says, pat it and prick it and mark it with a, you know, a letter for baby and me, um, that comes from the policy in that well, not policy, but most urban homes during the 16th century didn't have ovens and fireplaces in them because chimneys were a relatively new invention and ovens, well, they're expensive, they're costly and potentially quite dangerous when you've got people living in what are essentially, I guess, the pre-runner to high-rise building blocks. And so an oven is a, is, a, is a bad idea. A bread oven gets to a very high temperature, so it's a very good point via vector starting point. So most women, once this process had been done, the dough's ready, it's ready to go in the oven, they would go down to a publicly owned, run and operated oven. So a community bread oven, or they would go to a professional baker who had his own bread ovens. So you would have to mark it with a letter or a particular steam vent or, or something so that people would know it was your bread once it was done because you might have 20, 30 families using the same oven. History facts, dun dun dun. Anyway, into the oven, 20, 25 minutes, and let's see what happens. 20 minutes and, and a bit later, I kind of left it in the oven to dry out a bit because it looked a bit wet, but dun dun dun. dun. Bread achieved, bread achieved. Let's put that back up there and get a better shot of 
bread. So it's on a wire rack at the moment because if you don't put it on a wire rack, what happens is that steam builds up underneath it and then makes the bread soggy. So here we go. It's got a little bit of a exploding rice problem, as a poor Hollywood might say. It's a little bit overworked, possibly. I don't know, but I'll turn it over. Oh, it's sounding pretty hollow underneath, so it sh that means it should be fully cooked. I suppose the only thing left is to taste it and see how it's turned out, because it smells... It doesn't smell like beer. It did smell like beer when it was baking. The house does smell of lava now, but it smells pretty bread-like now. So I'll just put that down, keep it cool on the rack, and... Uh, I'll chop up an end piece and see what it's like. Here we are. Tudor bread taste test. It's definitely bread. Okay. It smells more beery on the inside. I think it might be a little bit underbaked. I mean, it's bouncing back when I press it, so that means it should be fine. And it's got <laughs> a nice crust. It's still quite hot, though. Not enough salt. I haven't put enough salt in there. That bit I got was all crust, so. <laughs> <laughs> all crust. All crust. Yeah, I didn't put enough salt in this. But, there's a nice crisp to it. It just feels very solid. It's uh, dense. Very dense. Um, yeah, needed, needed more salt. Definitely needed more salt. But it's definitely bread. <laughs> yeah, you can see how you would. This would be like finer bread than a rye or an oat bread, but. It is kind of sticking to my teeth. Yeah. I don't think. See, I don't think the rest. The recipe said one seven eight. I should put this on at two hundred. I think. But. With some butter. And a condiment, it should be fine. You can smell the beer, but I can't taste beer. Huh. Interesting experiment, and the lighting has been like woo 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 this it, whole time. It's summer. <laughs> well, that was making Tudor bread. An experiment. Maybe I shall do some more Tudor recipes in time. <laughs>